Hello everyone, and welcome back to another glorious session. My name is Ekrix, and my buddy here is Kinagustus. We are just building up our forces there with an army called the Centaurs. Recruiting a myriad of cavalry and notably Arthoreos spears. I see, I see. Because we're still in Arthoreos reforms at this stage. You know, it'll be another while, I'd say, before we get to Thorax reforms. But we are proceeding to uh, go and invade Maria's home province. We've been at war with the Marian Empire, so we're just trying to have a look. Uh, this is their home province of Maka, as it's called. Um, I see, I see. Uh, basically, this is like the absolute fringe edge of Maria's borders, historically. Because India does not really exist on this map. Really? Why not? Because Creative Assembly never thought to include India, probably because they weren't important in the... Um, you see, this is not... This is the map for the Imperator Augustus campaign. Okay. Not the Grand Campaign. Uh, Rome 2 has a bunch of smaller campaigns as well as the Grand Campaign. And they have their own respective maps. So we have Caesar and Gaul, which... Guess what that entails? What? Gaul, a little bit of Italy, North Italy, maybe a small bit of Britain, and Spain. Small bit of Spain, but mostly Gaul. Because it's about the Gallic War, Caesar's invasion of Gaul. Of course, of course. We, uh, we've got Wrath of Sparta, which is the Peloponnesian Wars, so that's just Greece. A detailed map of Greece. Um. Yeah, so the Marians have taken over, uh, I think it's Harmoisia. Yeah, it was Harmoisia. led by Belos, of all people. Uh, so, on other maps, there's Rise of the Republic, which is a detailed map of Italy. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then... Uh, among those other campaigns is, uh, oh yeah, we've Hannibal the Gates, which is a slightly more detailed map of the Mediterranean, because Second Punic War. And then finally we have Imperator Augustus, which is basically the time period of, um, just before we get to the first Roman Emperor, Augustus, it's just before then the Civil War is preceding that. Um, we're just engaging in selling settlements off. Um, and so that's a map that's about as big as the Grand Campaign map. And the DEI team decided they would use that map for, uh, their mod. So that is what we have here. So we're using the, so this campaign, even though it's the Grand Campaign, is basically using the Imperator Augustus map. And, yeah. So, Creative Assembly, because I guess Mari wasn't important at that time period, if they even existed, I'm not sure when the Marians ended, um, they never really included it. But, I guess with the DEI devs, they saw that there was at least some wiggle room to include Maria in the Grand Campaign, using that map. So they included them. Because again, Maria is a DEI unique faction. They do not exist in, in Vanilla Rome 2. So we're just getting some of the final additions for this army. Unit of Thoreo Spears. And trying to figure what is the missing unit I'm, I need. Probably another cavalry unit, I'd say. What do you think they're missing? It's probably a cavalry unit. I'm just not too sure at that moment. Like... You know, I'd need to have a good look at it even now just to see what it was I need. Have no so the Idrisians like to go for diplomacy here. The Idrisians want a defensive alliance, but I'm not interested in such things. I want to conquer the Idrisians eventually. But I'm preoccupied at the moment with my eastern campaign here. 
We're preoccupied on all sides. Sure, what are we gonna do? Well, not all sides. Mainly just the east. And another hidden agent exposed. Sure, what else is new? Hmm. So we got some research tech done, and we're just researching, researching more. So yeah, Persinuous. Yeah, we're selling that off to Lydia. One of our more loyal satraps. The Might of Heracles. Yeah, it's trying to see what we can do regarding Armenia. I think we're hoping to try and bail out. No, not really bail out, but I think we kind of want... Um, Why do we want to bail out? Well, I wouldn't really say bail out, but I think we're kind of hoping to make Armenia our satrapy. Do not try to charm. Uh, but they, because I think they rebelled, but still wants us to make them my satrapy <laughs> again. You think but it's worth the risk? I thought it was. I just was eager to have as many satrapies, but that's tricky to do, especially with the way the um, Total War AI tends to be. Well, what would be the benefit of having multiple satrapy on your end? Um, well, they're kind of like allies, except they have no real power. They're not equals. They're subordinate. They give you money, I believe. They, 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 they give you money every turn. And they get involved in your wars. A lot That's like a really just... powerful ally. Maybe, well, maybe they we should continue to do it, so... Well, the idea is that they're much weaker than you. Oh... Okay, so that's like, that's like one of the negative attributes no, to negative. it. The whole okay. point is that they're your subordinate. They're weaker than you. Um, is the idea, but they could also rebel, and it is kind of a thing the Seleucids kind of have loads of. They start have a, with lots of satrapies, and a lot of them will rebel. Unless you can keep them all happy, which I tried to do, but a bunch of them rebelled anyways. They can never be satisfied, can they? You can't win. Not really. See, the thing is, a lot of them are not a part of the Greek culture. Most of them are like Persian culture, Eastern culture. And I think the Seleucids have a bit of a deep, a bit of a malice to diplomatic relations with kind of Eastern factions. Really? Yeah. Because Greek overlords, you might say. Well, yeah. There's that factor to take into account. So I'm sending a diplomat to Armenia. Let's hope, let's hope things work out on that end, then. Yeah. Trying to decide who else to send to. Is that list a bunch of the regions that you can send out your diplomats to? There are factions. Other factions, okay. Like Rome. I sent one to Rome. There's Rhodes, Sparta, the RDA, which are uh, Illyrians, the Idrisians, which are Thracian. Pretty much a um, wide majority of them. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Idrisians are a fun faction to play. Why? Uh, well, for one, they have a lot of shock troops. What are shock troops? Uh, basically, the the ideal way to use them is to charge, do a lot of damage with their heavy, high charge, and then kind of pull them out a little bit. Not good, and not great, or ideal in sustained melee, especially in a in a frontal assault. They they're have... basically just they're basically just like a full frontal assault that only lasts for like a few seconds or something. They're not good for the like most sustained ideal battles. Way to use them. These are the Rum Fire Warriors. They're equipped with a kind of a weapon called a Rum Fire. The Rum Fire was a kind of a uh, sort of like a, a sort of two-handed sword pole arm that was slightly curved and the sharp bit of the blade was kind of the the inner part of the curve 
Uh, there's been some rebels attacking one of our settlements that we cannot defend. And those kinds of weapons, I assume they were very powerful upon impacts, weren't they? They could be. And there was a very closely related weapon, the Dacians, which were related to people used, called the Falks. That was a lot more curved. And apparently that weapon gave the Romans a hard time when they invaded Dacia. Well, I would assume so, considering how powerful they were. Well, again, the way I understand it was I think it could kind of damage their shields and their helmets. Ooh, failed diplomacy. It could damage their shields and helmets. I think it could bypass the shield even and hit their arms. Um... And you think so, they would? You think they would have sorted that issue out if they could reach the shoulders very easily? Well, again, you know? the Romans wouldn't have known what to what to expect when dealing with the Dacians, I suppose. At first, they eventually did adapt. I believe they may have reinforced their helm. From what I understand, again, I don't know this too well, so I cannot comment without knowing any ancient source. This is a little bit outside of my kind of area. Because I am, again, more versed in the Hellenistic period, which is what this game is largely set in. The Roman Empire is beyond is, is well beyond the Hellenistic. It's not exactly within your area of expertise you could say to that. the max. I am more versed in the Hellenistic period. Yeah, yeah. The Roman, you like, especially you're earlier. talking about, like, around the peak of the Roman Empire... Which is like, I think its peak is around the second century CE, I and mean, this is in the reign of Trajan, I believe. Yeah, Trajan, because Trajan's column is the is when we had the Dacian Wars, and um, yeah, so. So I'm only going by what tidbits I understand, but basically I think the Falks could kind of bypass, could kind of somewhat bypass the shields and could damage, maybe even damage them quite badly and uh, even the helmets. So they think they reinforced the helmets or shields and I think they also started to wear the manica, a kind of um, basically piece of metal for, to cover the arm could be like segmented plate bands over the arm over there yeah, sword arm. yeah I suppose um, and that was what so he subjugated this new faction called Sardis that took Basinous but they don't have much worth levy much uh, satrapal levies to take on just Phrygian levies I should add another thing about satrapies is that you can kind of recruit some of their own units into your army. I assume that would have been the point anyway. Yeah, it's, it's satrapal levies is the idea. It's quite nifty. You can get some pretty powerful units that way that aren't a part of your faction. Well, they're not originally part of our factions, are they? Well, that's the whole point. So satrapal levies are units that belong to those factions. Oh, okay then. Like, notice how some of my armies had Parthian cataphracts? Or even these Parthian kind of heavyish horse archers with lances? So I'm pretty sure we've seen them before and I've talked about Parthian cataphracts. But those are satrapal levies. The Seleucids do not have access to such units. They have their own cataphracts, which they get in the late game, but not Parthian cataphracts. What's the difference? Well, the Seleucid cataphracts are Greek cataphracts. They're Greeks, more or less. Um, rather than the Parthians as cataphracts. Gameplay-wise, the Parthian cataphracts are generally be stronger. Especially with that uh, Nisean horse. 
So the Saluka counteracts wouldn't necessarily be what you're looking for in terms of your arsenal. Oh well, well they're solid. You there's no you can't go wrong with Saluka counteracts. But like the okay here you see this the you know, the terror Phobos. Yeah. You see the unit right next to the general. Yes. That's a Parthian counteract. Okay. So they're what I talk about Parthian counteracts. They're a levied unit, satrapal levy. Okay. Not a part of the Saluki roster. And they're quite powerful. Especially with the Nisean horse. Okay. Gives them all sorts of bonuses, mainly to their mass. Which is uh, important for cavalry, especially. So I get rid of units of Galthracian Cavalry. Looks like I'm just planning on it, but I try to see what I could recruit. So I decided not to get rid of them, at least for now. Let's hope that was a wise decision. Uh, probably just to get them replaced with something a little better. Would be the idea. They're solid cavalry, but you know. Let's put the Ptolemies to try to attack some pirates. Right, but Ptolemy's a third. Wow. Oh. I wouldn't expect that to happen. Okay. I guess it was a noble death indeed. Yeah, it looks like I lost my admiral. Perhaps. And I how could you tell? It didn't say you lost your admiral. Well, because you, you see how there was one army that was wiped out? And even yeah. here, Atreus. Because when the Ptolemies attacked those pirates, my garrison fleet and the Admiral I had were reinforcing. Oh, okay. And I auto-resolved. So, he was killed. Well, I'm sure he fought with honour, regardless. Maybe. I see we're, uh, we got some more arsenal firepower there. Yeah, some nice little bonuses. We're gonna go with the wise man. Yes, it's always great to have a wise man in your army. I see we're handling the brothers of Xenophon, hoping to send them out somewhere. Hopefully to meet up with the Terror of Phobos. And I see the Terror of Phobos has decided to lay siege on some area here that I have yeah. no idea where it is. <laughs> Hula, I think it is. The capital ah. of the Marians. Well, the capital of the Marian faction that we have here. Not the actual capital of the actual <laughs> I don't think anyone is. Yeah, that would be confusing, all right. But yeah, so the uh, Adrissians have Rump Fire Warriors, which are quite strong. Um, likewise, the Marians have the... They have their own shock troops. Uh, shock infantry. Like their axemen, the guildsmen, and the elite macemen. Okay. So they have all two handed weapons and no shields. Well, the guildsmen have uh, small little shields strapped to like their arms. But otherwise, they don't have any shields. But they can be pretty deadly units. I dare not ask much for my people. Only a single payment to replenish our sadly diminished coffers. Alright, well, what are you offering? I wonder what malevolent spirits were whispering in. Yeah, should it, Knossos? Yes, exactly. Shut and up. No one cares what you think. Chose to attend. Rebellion outside of Harmosia. Two rebel armies. Look how bad public order is. Where's public order when you need it? Proper public order. Yeah, there's ex another extreme drought. It's causing attrition for my army. Oh, well, that's not good, is it? Nope. That's not good, is it? Nope. Let them power like it ain't.
Which shows you what mercenaries you could possibly get. We'll do reservations to Madda there, and uh, hopefully the brothers Xenophon can uh, wrangle things up for us. Maybe if not them, maybe the Spears of Ares. Oh, no, no, they're going to meet the brothers of Xenophon now. No, they're meeting the heroes among men. Oh, the heroes among men. Sorry, I thought it was the same faction. An interesting name, the Brothers of Xenophon. I'm assuming this is a name made up for the campaign itself. They weren't like an actual army, were they? No, but Xenophon was a historical figure. Was he a Seleucid figure? No, he was he was Greek. He was an Athenian, I think. Ah, okay. He um he's one of our main sources for the Peloponnesian War. Really? Yeah, you see, the Peloponnesian War was first largely written down by Thucydides. But then Thucydides' narrative just stops like halfway through it. Probably because he died. Okay. Xenophon continues the narrative in his Hellenica. So he picks up where they left off, basically. Yeah, he basically. picks up where Thucydides left off. I think specifically he says starts a thing with meta de tauta after these things mm, the Marian attack in our settlement the full yeah, garrison it's not, looking, not looking too good on our end the life bringers quick say so we can fight it out okay let's hope for the best yeah. though it's not looking very likely well we'll see so well, who are we uh, up against? Maria. Maria, okay. So Xenophon, um, he so he not only really wrote the Hellenica. He wrote a variety of texts. I think the the um, Oikonomikos uh, was another one, just kind of about like um, how like how how to run a household, I think. And also he wrote. Which I've talked about before, the Anabasis. Um, he was part of a collective of Greek mercenaries hired by the Persian prince Cyrus the Younger. Cyrus had planned on overthrowing his brother Artaxerxes the Second, so he hired a bunch of Greek mercenaries known as the 10,000. It was a bit more than 10,000. Um, mostly kind of like Greek mercenary hoplite types, a few hundred Cretan archers and various mostly Thracian peltasts. They met at uh, the Battle of forget what it's called actually really I wouldn't have thought that you would have forgotten the name I just it uh... just it didn't it just drifted from your mind yeah that's okay um but this particular battle that was a bit of a disaster and Cyrus was killed and that meant the Greeks kind of had to sort of figure out how the hell did they get back. Oh, yeah. I heard about this tale, actually. Yeah, like, I've spoken to you about it. Yeah, um, so... It, so that's what the Anabas is about, and Xenophon was a part of it. They, and they... They actually... They, I remember, they had to make a choice. They could try to continue on through unclaimed territory... Well, they, they could try to continue on through hostile territory uh, with no sort of reinforcements whatsoever being constantly attacked on their flanks or they could simply choose to just retreat and just get the fuck out of there and they had to walk for like hundreds and hundreds of miles with all the odds against them but somehow through pure fucking willpower they managed to make it out of there alive something like that possibly um there's an interesting little anecdotes about various skirmishes they had and it's quite interesting well at least in the sense you can learn it it's where you kind of come across mentions of like Rhodian singers 
um, the 10,000 get kind of ambushed by uh, a satrap called Mithridates. And the Peltasts and Cretan archers are struggling against the Persian forces. Because whilst the Cretans are very skilled, they don't have great range. They're outranged by the Persian archers. Um, and Peltas, but they have javelins. So they're not going to have that much range against slingers or archers. So, I think Xenophon apparently went here. Don't we have Rhodians amongst us? They're you. They're quite good at the sling. So they hired. A, they paid a bunch of Rhodians among in the group, and uh, they proved quite useful. Okay. Because the Rhodians are apparently quite skilled at the sling and using lead bullets. Lead and shot. So that proved quite useful. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. It was quite interesting because I remember uh, I ranted or I, I, I complained before about a YouTuber called Ancient History Guy. Yeah, and he got some video. of his facts wrong. He got them from, like, less than uh, ideal sources. Yeah. I remember you telling me about this. Yeah, he um, he did a video about Cretan archers, and I don't think there was too much he got wrong, per se, just a lot he didn't include that I thought would have been worth including, and may have also added a bit more clarification to things. And his sources were like Encyclopedia Britannica and like world history. Yeah, not exactly history cutting himself. Uh, not exactly cutting himself with a lot of options there for reliable sources. At no, the very least. it would seem like he would never seem to even read the ancient sources themselves. He probably just did like a Cliff Notes version of it. it he wouldn't even mention them in his sources. So I, I like. I feel like if anything, he more likely. Um, would you know at least go on when he, the when you're to go on to Google on Scholar at the very least, don't you think? Huh? Uh, I mean, like that sort of thing that you you would have to research for that sort of video. You would probably be best going on stuff uh, from Google Scholar as well, not just Britannica as Maybe, well. Maybe, but I suppose the whole point was his stuff was kind of lazy. That's the way I saw it. The fact was, he was probably only interested in making short, max five minute videos about these topics, and a simple Google on these generic bloggy type sites was more than enough for him. So he wouldn't even look at a book, or Google Scholar, it, or even read the ancient sources, which are usually available online for free. Granted, they're usually old translations, but better than nothing. <laughs> Yeah. He probably didn't want to bother with like learning all sorts of other different languages just to get that info. You don't have to, and you'll find translations of these things online for free. Getting old, but still. Like, I don't own any physical copy of Polybius' histories. If I want to read Polybius, I just go on probably in the Perseus site, and that has an old translation of Polybius. Uh, you know? That's often what I've used. Yeah, I know. Like, I think the only ancient texts I have physically would be Homer's Iliad, Odyssey, and, and Virgil's Aeneid, the Epic of Gilgamesh, um, Xenophon's Anabasis, and that's mostly, oh yeah, I have Arist Aristophanes' plays, a few of them. I think mo most of his plays, actually, I have. Um, that's mostly it for, like, ancient sources I've got physically, in physical book form. Uh, yeah, I'm just looking at my shelves now, that's about it. I suppose I have Ketesius' on India, I suppose I have that also. And I have a, a, a book that's like a compilation of different Hellenistic ancient accounts and stuff, inscriptions and all that. But yeah. 
But anyway, so looks like we're doing well. We haven't been commentating about this battle, but broadly, as you can see, it was a straight up typical frontal assault. They tried to hit us in the flanks with particularly their chariots, but that didn't work. Um, and once we were kind of able to clear that up, we just moved our troops around, enveloped them, hit them from behind, and now they've all broken. Yeah, I saw that uh, the Morians had um, these sorts of like horse chariots or something. Yeah. Do you know what those were? They're chariots. Did they horse have them. a specific name for those chariots, or, or were they just like regular ass chariots? They're like royal. They're like a sort of a bodyguard royal chariot thing. I don't know. Oh, Heavier chariots. Okay. They have art. The guys on them have bows. They they got like the side bits to them. Oh, right, right. Uh, I was wondering if they had that. Yeah, it looks like they... I think they do. I don't know any information about them. The only people who do would probably be, like, Summary and Swaraj who designed these units. When they reworked the Marians. Um, so I can't comment about them, really, historically. <laughs> I, I know too little. I know bugger all about the Marians militarily. I largely trust the DEI did what it did and they knew what they were doing. Other than the fact that they would have extensively used war elephants, that's all I can say. Mm. But yeah. Well, we seem to be holding our own regardless. Well, we're pretty much just clearing up the stragglers. It's basically just a clean up job for us. Yeah, pretty much all it is though. <laughs> But I think we are reaching the end. About another minute to go, but still, we're pretty much at the end. Indeed. We've just managed to stave a victory in the face of certain, in the, against the odds of certain defeat. We managed to persevere in the end. Could look at it that way, I suppose. A simple garrison against a Marian army. It was a field battle that wouldn't have gone well, but we were to take advantage of the of the city to narrow their focus, and that benefits a phalanx heavy army. Narrow passageways and choke points do very well for phalanx troops. Just look at the battle of Thermopylae. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. I should clarify the first battle of Thermopylae. Ah, that's the most important distinction there. Because there were three battles of Thermopylae. Yes, yes. The first one in the Greco-Persian Wars, that's the best known. The second is when the Greek Celts invaded Greece. And the third one is the Seleucids versus the Romans. Remember, dear viewers, remember that. But anyways, that's enough for now.